The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are going back into 1 Kings 17. We're going to continue this series, Transition with God. And in this series, we've been going word by word through the story of Zarephath, Elijah's second transition that takes place after he is called by God. He goes to the brook Cherith. And then after that, he makes a transition where he goes to Zarephath. But the call to go to Zarephath is very different than the call to go to Cherith. And it's different for one reason. It's what we're going to talk about today is what we call a beckoning desire. Meaning God's going to call it forth for you to desire to go. If he has to call something forth on the inside of you for you to do it, it means that it was not obvious. And obvious is probably not the right word. But it wasn't automatic. You didn't already have the desire to go. That's why God needed to bring it forth out of you. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit today, why it's so important. And we're going to look at another passage in the Bible that will help illustrate this point even deeper. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump right into the lesson. Just the only announcement we got is we do have discipleship tonight in our end times curriculum. So please make sure you're in class tonight. But Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll go with me to 1 Kings 17. We'll start in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there should not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a curse, 
And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the curse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he in her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. I love reading this passage, and I've read it so many times. I mean, we've read this passage in the church hundreds, if not thousands of times at this point. Definitely in the multiple hundreds of times I've read through 1 Kings 17. Because over and over we reiterate these truths and we sow this seed into your heart. We sow this seed into my own heart and into this ministry. Because 1 Kings 17, 3, 4 is what God used to bring us to where we are today. And I just want to announce that we are, we are going to release more information on the next stages of Blank Slate Ministries and what we are going to do sometime this week so we haven't announced it yet but we will be announcing those things very shortly so just be in prayer for us be seeking the lord um, i am following the wisdom of god this the supernatural knowledge and wisdom that is hidden in god so we are just pushing in and looking for god's open door and we will release more information on that very very soon but let's talk about this story when god tells elijah to go to the brook Cherith, he says, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. He tells them to go. That's a very important thing. And it is an easy move for Elijah to go to the brook Cherith. Now, let me pause right there and say this. When I say easy, it's not necessarily easy. Because the very first step in your ministry journey, going into seclusion or into isolation, when walking out your divine purpose, is probably the hardest move that you will have to make because to go from the city and the place in which you were living around everything that you know all the provision all the sustainment all of the relationships from everything you know to be separated out to be by yourself that right there is not necessarily easy i say it's easy because it's easier than the next thing we're going to talk about but it's not an easy move so i want i want you to know that ahead of time it takes sacrifice you know and, and the and the lord desires this over our life that we live sacrificially when we study through the song of solomon which we just finished all of the verse by verse in our advanced curriculum it's the fact that his lips are like lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh now his lips like lilies is referring to the purity in the way he talks to us but it drops sweet smelling myrrh and now myrrh was a burial spice. It's used in the embalming process of, you know, embalming a body to go to burial. So when he speaks to us, not only is it in purity and in holiness, but he's calling us to sacrificial living every time he talks to us. It's, it's one of the deepest truths of the word of God that you die to self, live unto God, and God's life is sacrificial. The way in which Jesus lived was always sacrificial. He was always thinking of the other person. He was always thinking of us and not of himself. And this is something that we grow up into. And it's not natural in the natural human flesh and human makeup to live sacrificially. It's the root and the dangers of pride and ego and so many other things that cause us to value ourselves over others. So living sacrificially is not natural. It is something that you have to grow into. That's why you grow into the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. It takes time to get there. And the very first step, like I said, is I say it's easy because it's easier, but it's a hard step because it's an act of surrender and sacrifice of everything that you're used to. Abraham had to leave his entire family. God called him out. Jesus called the disciples out. You didn't get to stay where you were at. It's a very important point. But in the call, God just tells him to go. Then it's the act of obedience that takes place when Elijah goes to the brook Cherith. Very different than when God calls him to Zarephath. Because when God calls him to Zarephath, he just doesn't say, get thee to Zarephath. He says, arise, get thee to Zarephath. 
Now that's an important point because that word arise is where we get our understanding of God's beckoning desires. Now let's talk about this for a minute, why we talk about a beckoning desire. I've taught this passage many times and I've asked people when I show them this passage, maybe they've read it before and never understood it. A lot of people glance over a lot of the Old Testament because they don't see the truths in it. But this ministry is rooted in this passage, so I share it with people all the time. And I always say, what do you think it means when God says, arise, get thee to Zarephath? And the number one response we've seen is people say, well, God's telling them to stand up, go. Okay, so let's talk about this for just a second. When Elijah is at Samaria, do you think Elijah is sitting down or standing up? Now, you got to understand, Elijah is talking to a king which means he's either probably kneeling before King Ahab or he's sitting at the table when he declares the word of the Lord to Ahab. He's probably not standing. He might be, but he's probably not. But the whole point is it doesn't tell you one way or another what Elijah is doing when he's in Samaria when God tells him to go to the brook Cherith. He just tells him to go, which means start walking. Go that direction. The actual physical act of movement. When God tells him to go to Zarephath, he says, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Now, was Elijah standing or was Elijah sitting? You don't know. The passage doesn't tell you what's happening. Because it has nothing to do with the physical posture of man in that situation. Meaning, we don't know if Elijah was sitting down or standing up when God told him to go to Cherith. The same thing, we don't know if Elijah was sitting down or standing up when God told him to go to Zarephath. You don't know which one's which. You don't know what was going on in the story when he goes. It just says arise. So you have to study the definition of arise. Because the word arise has a context of the physical posture of man rising up. Meaning you're sitting down and you're standing up. It has an act of that. But the word arise has a rooted definition of impulse. And if you don't know what impulse is, impulse has to do with desires that cause you to move. So let me say this. If something arises on the inside or it moves in you internally, it will cause externally or outwardly the act of movement. So let me say this again. Arise is not about, it's not about the physical posture of standing up that's not what it's about even though that is a consequence of the desire the desire on the inside of your heart will cause an outward action so though people stand up or they stood up meaning they physically were sitting down and then they stood up it first came from the desire on the heart so when god says arise get thee to zarephath he speaks that word into the heart of elijah He's not saying, Elijah, you're sitting down, now stand up and go. What he's saying is, I'm speaking to your heart and I'm calling forth an impulse or a desire to go. So we learn a lot from this passage when we talk about this word arise. Because the physical act of sitting down to standing up is important because you obviously you cannot walk if you haven't stood up first. But we're not talking about standing up. We're talking about God speaking into his heart and saying, Arise! Meaning this desire that's on the inside of your heart needs to first start in the heart, rise up through you, and come out of you. Jesus used to say, Jesus said that what is in you will come out of you. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, what you do is a reflection of what is inside of you. That's an important truth to remember. Now, we always understand that there are sometimes you you make a mistake, you fall in compromise, you do desire to do right, but yet you're struggling. Remember that all sin resides in the flesh. And God is a righteous judge, meaning he sees your heart even when you're struggling in sin. So just always remember that. But God wants to call forth this desire. So as I studied this passage over and over, and I was trying to figure out the best place to give you examples on what this passage means, the Lord spoke to me and said, go to 2 Peter. As I was studying, 
the Lord was just speaking this verse to me, or these verses. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, if you know anything about this ministry, we have preached 2 Peter chapter 1 so many times. Because the very beginning of 2 Peter 1 is the understanding of receiving the promises of God, God through knowledge. And that if you lack in the knowledge of God, then you cannot receive. You forget where you've been delivered from, and you can't walk in everything that God has ordained you to be. And then the passage starts to go into an understanding of who we follow and what we receive and what we don't, and to not be deceived. And that's the very next thing. But then it goes into this verse. So let's go into... 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read starting in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this is powerful, and this is very different than what we're talking about, because we're talking about the word of Elijah, or the word of God to Elijah to go to Zarephath. It's very different than a, a teaching that we could have on prophecy and the understanding of the prophetic scriptures of old times prophesying of what comes to pass. But instead of disregarding this passage, I want to give you an understanding not of the prophecy part, but of how this applies to what we're talking about today. Because it, if you remember in prophecy, it bubbles up. That's one way prophecy comes. Or people what we are what in the Old Testament were called a seer. So you have seers and then you have people where the prophecy bubbled up. Like Isaiah it bubbled up, whereas Samuel saw. That's why he was called a seer. But the important part about understanding that prophecy is like light shines in darkness it says until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart now the word day star is a very specific word because it's talking about the light of the sky in you it's a reference of the the morning star the light of it and how it illuminates darkness but what it's saying is this word arise right here in 2 Peter chapter 1. One of the definitions it has is it has to do with tropical. Tropical to rise up. Meaning that something that was cold and frozen that could not bear fruit going up in the way of a tropical sense into the heat to where it can produce. And you might say, Cody, how does that have any understanding of what we're talking about? When we talk about prophecy, we're talking about the Word of God in a place in your heart where it has no movement, meaning it's bad soil, it's stony ground, it's the wayside, it's among the thorns. It's a way in which it cannot produce fruit, the same way in which frozen ground cannot produce. But when God is speaking into your heart, He's as the day star. He's as a rise from a place that cannot bear to a place that bears fruit. Meaning a place that was cold and barren to a place that's tropical and hot and, and humid and it's got good soil. There's a reason why there's rainforest in the rainforest around the equator and there is almost nothing up in the Arctic. Because the soil around the equator produces more fruit because of the heat. The same way in which the day star, the same from dark to light and cold to hot. It's, it's the way in which we cultivate the soil of our heart to be able to produce fruit. That's why this definition has to deal with the tropics. Because it's dealing with the ability to produce. And we understand that the producing of fruit of the Word of God inside of our heart is the way in which the Word of God goes in us and changes us outwardly. So this word rise, the day star arise in your heart, is talking about the way in which when God, the prophecy, the prophetic word of God comes in you to come out of you, the way it comes up and out and it moves people. 
Now, the movement is not the thing that takes place first. Before the actual movement of going, there is first an arising on the heart level. There's the, the, the word has to come alive. It has to rise up. It has to stand up on the inside of your heart first. That's what we call the desire. That's what we call God's beckoning desire. We could talk more about this word of prophecy. I know I'm just very generally going over it. Because in 2 Peter chapter 2, he dives into the understanding of false prophets. And we could talk about that for quite a while, but we're not going to today. I just want you, I want you to see this as prophecy. The, the, the holy men of God were moved. Where they spoke prophetically and moved with the Lord. And, and as God spoke to them and they moved in different seasons of their life. Before the outward action of moving, before Elijah can actually start taking the physical steps to go to Zarephath, it has to first start in his heart. It has to first start in his heart. And you might say, well, why is it different than Cherith? If God just tells him to go to Cherith, but instead of just saying, go to Zarephath, he says, arise, go to Zarephath. If you were to study that in the Hebrew, that's a double verb. Rise, arise, go to Zarephath. Cherith is just go. This is arise, go. Two verbs. You might say, well, Cody, why is there a double verb at the beginning of verse 9 in this word arise? Why is it so different? Let's talk about this for just a second as we get ready to close in the last few minutes that we have together today. When you go into the secret place, I said it from the beginning, going to Cherith is easy. Now, it's not necessarily easy as most people would think because you have to give everything up to do it. It's sacrificial. But it is easy in the sense that God is taking you away from the evil in which you are around. I've heard so many amazing men and women of God. Dr. Summerall used to say it. Wigglesworth used to talk about it. Curry Blake has talked about it. I've known so many people to talk about it where they would say, when I very first started in the ministry, it was all about doing work, meaning go out and evangelize and go out and preach the word and go out and do. And it was all about the outward action, conferences and speaking and evangelistic and healing. And those things are great. There's nothing wrong with any of them. I think you should have all of those operating in your life. They're all good things. But they said as they grew older in the Lord and grow in maturity, you know, they are like, I've been with the Lord 40, 50 years. And as I've gotten to this point, all of them, every single one of them that I've heard has said, I desire more the secret place, being alone with God, than I do to do the work. At the beginning, I thought it was all about the work. They said, but as I got older, it became more about the secret place, the intimate time with the Lord, away from everybody else. They, they, they would say, I would rather spend all day with the Lord than preaching the word. And not that I and they would say, not that I don't love preaching, and they see miracles and mighty things of God, but it would be better to be alone with the Lord. And as I heard these men and women of God testify about this over and over and over, and I saw it in my own life. When I moved to Chicago, I was, I was ready for all of the work. Get out there and do this and do that and do this and do that. But the Lord put me in the secret place. And then I realized the more I was in the secret place, the more I desired the secret place than I did the actual work of the ministry. Because it's better to be alone with God than to have to deal with people. Now, there's nothing wrong with people, but people have their own emotions and their own will and their own this and their own that. They may receive you, they may reject you, they may persecute you, they may slander you, they may love you, they may give to you. I mean, there's so many different responses that people can give to you, whether they accept it or reject it, and all of the different ways in which that can manifest from them to you. And not saying that all of them are bad, because some of them are very good. Getting people born again, very good. Like, But to do the work in a city means you have to take on the responsibility of the response of others. Whereas you alone with God, you only are responsible for your response to God. That's why it's better to be alone. Because there's only one response, God's love to you and your love back to God. That's the only thing that's happening. 
There is no other things that are taking place. There's no other outside things that influence it. You're at the brook. You're alone with God. And that's greater. But when you go into the city, it requires you to be now taking care of others and the responsibility of how people respond and not getting offended and not being offensive and all the things that take place when you are ministering. And that's a big responsibility. So to go from a place of isolation in the secret place to go into a place where you're now in the city and now you have to deal with others, that's not an easy move. And it is a way harder. It's easy to get alone with God. It is hard to do the work. The work of the ministry is not easy. And so making that transition, God can't just tell Elijah to go because I know if I was Elijah, I would tell God, no, I'm not going. I want to be with you alone. But what God says is, arise. He speaks that word, which draws influence. It draws desire. It's a beckoning desire on the inside of the heart that comes up. It stands up inside of you to want to go. And once that desire makes you want to do it, then you will go. But God has to call it forth because there is no desire to leave the secret place. People don't desire to leave the presence of God. But God has to call it forth for them to do it. That's why this word arise is so important. Because it's God calling forth the desire on the inside of the heart for you to walk in everything that God has spoken for you to do. We're out of time today. So Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory. God, let the desire come on the inside of our heart to do the work of the ministry. I thank you for it. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. I pray you have a great day today. Remember, if you're in our discipleship class, we have class tonight. So church, have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I? You take good care of me You take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask the thing And you hold me in your hands With the kindness that never ends And carried in your love No matter what the future brings The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Take good care.